How's everyone doing? Oh, you can't answer me. I can't hear you, but you can answer me if you want. Let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for this time that we have to be together, uh, even if it's virtually. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that you give me to uh, minister to your people. Lord, I thank you, uh, Lord, that we, that we greet this day today with love in our hearts and thankfulness and thanksgiving in our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you have the ability to leverage technology for your glory. Lord, we, we understand that there are many around the, the nation and around the world uh, who are visiting, who are here, who are peering in today. And we just thank you for that, that we have the opportunity to, to hang with some of our friends and family all over the world. Lord, we also thank you that you uh, leverage flawed people. Lord God, I'm reminded of Paul who said that, that you're pleased to use the foolishness of preaching uh, to save those who believe, Lord God. And so we just ask that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart will be acceptable uh, in your sight, Lord God. And also, we also thank you how you leverage uh, a worldwide pandemic, Lord God, for your glory, that somehow, some way, in all this, I think we're people who always want to have the answers to everything. Uh, but Lord, this is a, a time where there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of uh, misinformation. There's a lot of obscurity, Lord God. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. Right. And so we thank you for that, Lord God, that you are here. You are among us, Lord. We echo the, the prayer of the psalmist who said, may all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. And it's with that, Lord God, that we enter into this time of your word. And so we just thank you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 John Roger Stevens is an American singer, songwriter, producer, uh, who's very well known in the music industry. Uh, because he's a collaborated with many established artists, many of whom you would know very well by name. Um, he uh, is one of a handful of people to have ever won what they call an EGOT, which is an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. Yes, that is a thing. Uh, he's actually the second youngest person to have ever done it. And so as his career was taking off, he was uh, introduced to a poet who was very fond of his work. And so the poet pulled Stevens aside and he said, Hey, I've heard your music and you've got that music of the old school. You, you, you sound like one of the legends. Matter of fact, that's what I'm going to call you from now on. And there it was. John Legend was born. Now, in 2005, John Legend released an album that had a single on it that took him from a high potential artist to an international star. Uh, this Grammy Award winning song is called Ordinary People. Now, this song uh, it talks about the complexity of relationships and how incredibly difficult it is uh, to make relationships work. Uh, Legend, uh, being one of four children in his home uh, who watched his parents marry each other twice and divorce each other twice, he knew the complexity of relationship very well. Now, I believe it's the second verse in his song that I think he sums up relationship really well. He says this, he said, this ain't a movie, nah. No fairy tale conclusions, y'all. It gets more confusing every day. Sometimes it's heaven sent, then we head back to hell again, and we kiss and we make up on the way. Now, if you ask me, that's marriage in a nutshell. That's marriage right there. Now, I had a mind to sing that for you today, but I've been getting capped on all week by my girls saying I can't sing, so <laughs> I have no confidence to sing right now. Uh, but this song struck a chord in his listeners as... Uh, it became apparent just listening to the song that many of the private battles that we fight in our homes are more common than we think. You know, we're all just ordinary people. Would you agree? So we're in a series that we've been calling Searching for Significance. And uh, in this series, we've been discussing what it looks like to find meaning in the mundane areas of life. And we've been anchored in a book by Tim Keller called Every Good Endeavor. And in the book, Keller has been talking about connecting our work, our vocations, and our callings to the work that God is doing in redeeming the world. And so as I sat down, as I began to prep for this, man, I thought of one of the first things I thought about was the family. 
I thought about the vocation of the family. I thought about the home. I thought about marriage and, uh, and parenting. And in the weeks that followed, you know, we got ourselves to a place where now we're all being asked to stay in and we're all quarantined. So all we really have to do right now is really sit amongst our family and spend time with our family. So I just figure, you know, what better time than this right now than to talk about what God is doing in our homes and among our families. Keller in the book, he references the reformers who searched the scriptures and they insisted that marriage is ordained by God. And that the family is the arena in which some of the most important spiritual work is being done. Uh, matter of fact, Martin Luther said it this way. He said, marriage is a better school for the character than any monastery because it is there that our corners are rubbed off. See, uh, your home is the most challenging place to live out the gospel implications. No one is more exposed to your sins and your flaws than your family. And I can also say that the other way too. No one's more exposed to your family's sins and flaws than you are. And so God is using the daily grind and your micro choices uh, to train your heart. He is. Uh, Keller in the book, he, he references uh, vocation as the mask of God, which is to say that God hides himself in the mundane activities that make up most of our lives. God hides himself in those activities. See, you know, when, when you love your spouse well, even when you're not getting anything back in return, when you strive with an overly dependent, self-absorbed child who is sapping every ounce of energy out of you, when you are completing the daily, endless, thankless tasks of cooking, cleaning, laundry, dishes, etc., but when you are doing those things, God is doing something in you by his spirit that has eternal value. So I believe it was Peter who said it this way. In 2 Peter, he said, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through, the, through the, the knowledge of him who has called us out of his own glory and excellence. See, you have everything you need for a life of godliness in cultivating in your home because excellence is accomplished when we do the ordinary extraordinarily well. How do we do this, huh? How is this accomplished? You know, I believe John Legend actually says it best. He, he speaks for humanity where he says, we're all just ordinary people. We don't know which way to go. But, but then enters in Jesus, who's the focal point of our text today. And so if you have your Bible, turn with us to Mark chapter six. Now, if you're familiar with Jesus' travel itinerary in the book of Mark, you, you will see that Jesus started his public ministry in Capernaum. And there he taught, he recruited disciples, he uh, healed people, he did miracles. And then he slid to a nearby city called uh, Genesaret. And there he healed a man, but he made the townspeople upset and they asked him to leave. And so he jumps on a boat, he goes across the Sea of Galilee, and he stops in another town called Decapolis. But by Mark chapter six, Jesus is headed to his hometown of Nazareth. And surely by this time, they have heard of his teachings. They have heard of the miracles and the healings that he's doing. But, but I want you guys to see just how they treat this hometown kid. All right, so Mark chapter six, we're gonna start in verse one. It says, Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown and the disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things from? And what is this wisdom given to him and such miracles as performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter? Isn't this the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his uh, sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, verse four, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his own relatives and in his own household. And so I believe that uh, we see a couple things. Uh, Jesus's homecoming shows us three things. This is what I wanna to talk to you about today. Jesus's homecoming shows us the hiddenness of God's kingdom, the ordinariness of God's people and the magnification of God's message, okay? Mm -hmm. The hiddenness of God's kingdom, the ordinariness of God's people and the magnification of God's message. All right, so first, the hiddenness of God's kingdom. Jesus arrives in his hometown of Nazareth. 
And one of the first things he does, he walks into the synagogue and he begins to teach from scripture. Now, now think about this with me. One of the first things Jesus does when he gets home is an act of love in service. And the people are amazed and astonished. They're amazed. Okay, it, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, what, what the demands of home life puts on us. You know, when I was a, a 20-year-old youth pastor, I was being mentored by a man who came up to me one day. and He said, Sean, are you qualified for ministry? To which I quickly responded, yes. To which, to which he quickly responded, no. <laughs> he said, go home, get married, start a family, and come back and see me in a couple years, and I'll tell you if you're qualified. Listen, I was so upset. I was so furious when he said that to me. But what I know now that I didn't know then is that family, uh, that marriage and children are, are sort of greenhouse for spiritual formation. Uh, they're, they're a greenhouse. See, in order to thrive in family life, you have to discipline your heart to always have an attitude that says, forget about me. I love you. Mm. That's it. Forget about me. I love you. And as you begin to do that over and over again and day after day after day, you begin to embody some of the major principles in the kingdom of God. You know, it's like the, the movie, uh, The Karate Kid. Remember that movie? <laughs> right? You remember Daniel wanted to uh, be taught karate by Mr. Miyagi. So he asked him that, to, to teach him karate. And all Mr. Miyagi did was assign him these mundane, ordinary, seemingly pointless chores to do. Remember, wax on, wax off, mm -hmm. right? He, he had him wax his car. He had him sand his floor. He had him paint his fence. And right about the time that Daniel began to get fed up and he was about to quit, Mr. Miyagi reveals to him that all these mundane chores were actually preparing him for karate greatness. See, that's what it's like living in your home. <laughs> that, that's what it's like, all right? That, that's what family life is doing for us. Family life is doing it. Your engagement and love and service towards your family will determine your ability to win or lose Christ likeness and beautiful character. The kingdom of God is hidden in your family. It's hidden. Let, let me let me try to go around the mountain a different way. So the number one commandment in scripture, a second only to loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is to love your neighbor as yourself. But I would submit to you that your spouse and your children are your first and nearest neighbor, right? Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself, pick up his cross and come after me. But where is it in our lives that we have to deny ourselves and pick up our cross more than in our homes? And at final judgment, uh, when we're looking to inherit the kingdom, According to Matthew 25, God's going to ask us a few questions. You know what he's going to ask? He's going to say, when I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me a drink? When I was a stranger, did you welcome me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was uh, sick, did you take care of me? When I was a prisoner, did you come visit me? And you will have the ability to say, yes, I disciplined my heart to be able to do those things because I first did them for those in my own home. See, the hiddenness of God's kingdom is found in the vocation yeah. of the family. Amen. Second, the ordinariness of God's people. Jesus comes back to his hometown. He walks into the synagogue. He teaches. The people are amazed and astonished. But then it dawns on them and they say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, where is he getting this from? How is he doing this? Isn't this the carpenter? Like, isn't this Mary's son? And they became offended at him. The people of his hometown became offended at the ordinariness of Jesus. Now, I was reading a, a commentary on the story that said that the people of Jesus' hometown could not veil of ordinariness surrounding him. To them, Jesus was too mundane, too, too ordinary. That's what he was. And so what they said is, isn't this the carpenter? Right? And so what they were really saying there is, you don't come from exceptional socioeconomic timber. All right? You're not a politician. You're not a religious leader. You're not even from a wealthy family in our community. 
right? You're just an ordinary guy. Like, like you made my kitchen table, or like you repaired my fence, all right? And, and then they said, isn't this Mary's son? Now, in that patriarchal society, you were never called Mary's son. You, you were always called by your father's name. You were never called by your mother's name. And so most commentators agree that this is almost certainly a reference to the fact that Jesus was born out of wedlock. And so what they were saying there is, uh, first of all, you don't come from exceptional socioeconomic timber and you sure don't come from exceptional moral timber either. Bro, we know your mama. <laughs> like, like we, we know where you come from. I, I used to babysit you. I used to wipe your nose. There's no way you're the savior of the world. You, you're, you're too ordinary. You're too familiar. Now, uh, there is some truth in the fact that familiarity breeds content. That is true. But I would also submit to you that familiarity breeds intimacy. Mm, it breeds intimacy. See, uh, uh, family life is this pendulum swing of amazement and offense. It's this pendulum swing of astonishment and rage, right? And although your ordinariness is the means of a lot of irritation uh, and, and offense in your home, it's actually uh, the, the basis of much calmness and healing as well. For instance, uh, your spouse has ultimate authority in your life because they know you so well. They have ultimate authority in your life because they know you so well. Uh, it, it, for instance, and this is what Keller would say, is that if your spouse calls you beautiful, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. Mm -hmm. Your neighbors can call you ugly. Your coworkers can call you ugly, even though they can't really see you to do that right now. Your, your, your Facebook friends can call you ugly, but you will still walk about feeling beautiful. Why? Because your spouse knows you so well. They have that ultimate authority. Now, as, as great as that is, it can also be used as a weapon because Keller would also say that if your spouse calls you ugly, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says. Your neighbors can call you beautiful. Your coworkers can call you beautiful. Your Facebook friends can call you beautiful. You will walk about feeling ugly because of that ultimate authority. You know, I, uh, I've been preaching for about 15 years and in the time that I've been preaching, um, I've often gotten off the stage, finished up, and people have come to me and they've said, man, Sean, you're anointed. Uh, and, and let me confess to you, as, as encouraging and helpful as that has always been, I've always had a hard time believing it until one day. Amy and I were counseling a couple. They came to our house. They sat at our kitchen table. They were at the brink of breakup. And in one conversation, we were able to help them out and get them uh, to reconcile. And as they got up from our kitchen table and they walked out of our house, they shut our door. Amy looks at me and she says, man, you're anointed. And for the first time, I looked back at her and I said, yeah, I, I think I am. Why? Because if anyone knows that I'm not anointed, <laughs> it's Amy. Right. It's her. Right. See, uh, familiarity has the ability to breed intimacy and, and, and much calmness and healing our lives. I was uh, recently walking around my house late at night. I was turning off all the lights and I walked past my daughter's room. And as I walked past, I heard their laptop on and I immediately went into dad mode because we're not allowed to have their laptops in there. And so I run and I bust into their room and I get in there and they're asleep. And I look at the screen of the laptop. And it's a video. I see a video of myself on stage preaching. Me. Like the one who offends them and irritates them every day is the one whose voice they want to hear as they go to sleep at night. Now, I don't understand this, but somehow through the ordinary home life that we have and familiar people, God is healing and forming us into the image of his son. Amen. Lastly, the hiddenness of God's kingdom and the ordinariness of God's people leads to the magnification of God's message. God has strategically chosen to use marriage as a means to show us and explain his marriage relationship with us. And in his infinite wisdom, he parents us through parenting. He parents us through parenting. And in this short obscure story about Jesus going home, we get a glimpse of what the whole Bible was about. And so what is it about? The Bible is about God 
becoming flesh. The, the extraordinary one became ordinary in order to win us to himself. This is what the Bible is about. This is what it's about. Jesus came into this earth. He put on human flesh. And through the power of the spirit, he revealed himself by doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. This is what the vocation of the family is all about, right? And we're in a time right now uh, we, we all, we're all being asked to stay home and we're quarantined. And we're in the house constantly. But what I would say to you is what an opportunity this is for us to all opt in and lean into the primary way that Christ likeness is one mm -hmm. in our lives. So your participation in God's repair of the world begins at home. Yeah. Or to, to quote the great Dr. James Dobson, if your Christianity doesn't work at home, it doesn't work. And the power to do this well comes from what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And so we're going to pray in a minute. But before we do, I think it's important for you to know that today is a significant day in the Christian church. Uh, today marks the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, today is Palm Sunday. This is the day that we celebrate Jesus entering into Jerusalem, the final week of his life. And as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, palm branches were laid in his path. See, early Jews would use uh, palm branches in order to symbolize the victory of the faithful over the enemies of the soul. You and I, in our homes, are being called to enter into a victorious life. A, a paradoxical one, I would say. See, because Jesus rode into Jerusalem and he did not count his equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself uh, and, and humbling himself, he gave himself over to be arrested, to be crucified and killed. Because the extraordinary one became ordinary, you and I, the ordinary ones, have the ability right now to do something extraordinary. Am, am I overusing this enough for you to get it? See, family life will feel like it's binding you and restricting you sometimes. It will, it will at times feel like a death. It will. And it's such a parallel to what Jesus did for us. Because when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, dying for you and for me, in so many words, he was basically saying to us, forget about me. I love you. Yeah. Think about that. Think about that. F-A-M-I-L-Y. Forget about me, I love you. The love and service you pour out daily through the mundane wax off, ordinary wax off, vocation and calling of your home to your family, to your spouse and to your children is doing something in you by his spirit that can never be undone. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you came, Jesus, that you wrapped yourself in human flesh. And that as you came and you wrapped yourself, you hid yourself on this earth, God, that, that you did something uh, ordinary to show us the extraordinariness of your glory. And I thank you, Lord God, that though we are what legend would say, ordinary people, Lord, we have the opportunity, uh, we have the opportunity right now, Lord God, to do that extraordinary thing to receive you. Listen, God does not want to improve you. God does uh, not want to modify you. God doesn't want to medicate you. He wants to heal you. He wants to love you. And so if there's anyone out there right now, it's maybe the first time you've ever heard the gospel message, or maybe uh, you've been out of church for a long time. Lord, I just ask that you would come into their lives and into their hearts, even now as they sit on their couch or in their homes, Lord God, that you would come in that you would do an extraordinary thing in their hearts. We just thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.